we must all be determined from this point onwards to make our minds peaceful. We focus our awareness upon knowing the in-breath and the out-breath together with the mantra, Buddha. Developing these basic meditation themes of Buddha Nusati, a recollection of the qualities of the Buddha, and Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, are a way of cultivating sati, that is, mindful recollection. We practice Dhamma in order to train ourselves to further the development of our hearts and minds. We practice meditation for the purpose of elevating our hearts to loftier, nobler heights, making it more excellent and sublime. All of us here possess confidence, faith and trust in the great teacher, the supremely enlightened Buddha. He was known as Sata Deva Manusanang, the teacher of gods and humans. The arising of a supremely enlightened Buddha, one who realizes ultimate truth for the welfare and happiness of the multitude, both earthly and celestial, is not a common occurrence. However, we have all gained the opportunity to encounter the Buddhasasana. The Lord Buddha set the wheel of Dhamma turning over 2,500 years ago, and with this first teaching, Venerable Anya Kondanya attained to the vision of Dhamma. This same teaching is still in motion, being realized and transmitted right into the present by the Lord Buddha's Sawaka Sangha, his enlightened disciples such as the most venerable Lumpur Cha, who practiced in accordance with the instructions of the fully enlightened teacher until he understood and realized the Dhamma for himself. He then established a base for training here at Wat Nong Papong. So Ajahnan gave this talk at Wat Papong at the annual gathering, producing a large following, many of whom are now senior monks and great teachers themselves. Therefore, as long as we still have faith and are alive, we have this opportunity to discover the teaching of the Buddha, its practice, and its realization. Every year we gather here at Wat Nong Papong to recollect the kindness of Lumpur Cha and to practice sitting and walking meditation as an offering to his memory. We make an effort towards the higher cultivation of the mind because the mind that has never been trained or developed will inevitably follow its worldly moods. When mindfulness and samadhi are weak and unreliable, the heart will naturally race along with these habitual moods and mind states, desire and aversion, sloth and torpor, agitation, restlessness and doubt. These five hindrances are what separate the heart from the good and wholesome and obstruct the realization of Dhamma. At this time, however, we can make an effort to train our hearts, trying to cultivate mindfulness whether standing, walking, sitting or lying down. Whatever our activity, be it drinking, thinking or talking, we have mindfulness, that is, clear recollection. Alternately, we can establish the recitation of a mantra, Bhutto, Dhammo or Sanko, to govern and guide our mind. Whether standing, walking, seated or reclining, we establish this internal recitation of Buddha to govern the mind's tendency towards distraction and diversity as it wanders about in the past and the future, continually proliferating. If we don't have a basic meditation object to govern and guide our mind, then it will be very difficult to make it calm and still the heart will inevitably just follow its usual variety of moods and preoccupations. However, when we put forth effort to train mindfulness and focus it on looking after the heart through recitation of a mantra, then it will gradually become more peaceful. The mind that used to be lost in proliferation, unable to settle in meditation for even five minutes, will become more peaceful, patient and resolute. We will then see that not training the heart results only in suffering because our outlook will always be wrong. When we are really determined to practice meditation and develop our hearts to know and see the Dhamma, then through the strength of this chanda, or genuine wholesome aspiration, we must endeavor to struggle and strive in accordance with the Lord Buddha's instructions. 
the way of practice to knowing, seeing and understanding Dhamma is the excellent path of sila, samadhi and panya, that is, the noble eightfold path. Today we recited the Dhamma Chaka Pawatana Sutta, recounting the Four Noble Truths of Dukkha, Samudaya, Niroda and Magga. And the reason we come here is to study these very truths, the way Dukkha suffering is, the way suffering is caused, Samudaya, the way suffering ceases, Niroda, how to practice in order to bring the heart to Niroda, the cessation of suffering. Chanting and reciting this way is a skillful means by which to study the Dhamma as practical theory. After we have memorized and recited the teachings like this, we are able to remember and understand them, so that when we begin the practice to realize the truth, then everything we contemplate becomes Dhamma. Practicing Dhamma means striving to abandon the unwholesome states that arise within our hearts making merit and maintaining the wholesome, and preventing unarisen, unwholesome states from arising. This is equivalent to the path factor of right effort. If we have no mindfulness, or don't control ourselves with mindfulness, then it is like a river without a dam. Without an embankment to contain the water, it will naturally overflow. In the same way, if we don't have any mindfulness, or our mindfulness is insufficient, then our habitual moods will inevitably flood in and overwhelm our mind. Therefore, we need to establish a strong and stable mindfulness by focusing upon the meditation mantra, Bhutto. We sit in meditation clearly knowing the in-breath and the out-breath, along with the mantra Bhutto watching over our heart, until eventually this internal recitation fades away and tranquility arises. Sometimes there is a feeling that mindfulness has gathered at one point within the body, such as the tip of the nose, for example. At this point, the heart is peaceful and firm in samadhi. Samadhi means concentration or concentrated awareness. The method of practice that results in right concentration is called samatha gamatana. This refers to those skillful techniques by which the heart is brought to total tranquility. The recitation of a mantra such as Bhutto, Dhammo, or Sankho, practicing mindfulness of breathing, or the contemplation of death, and so forth, are all forms of Samatha meditation. When the mind has been trained in Samatha meditation, then whether standing, walking, seated or reclining, there will be the excellent peace of Samadhi. Vipassana Gamatana refers to those meditation practices that bring us to correct knowledge and vision of the truth. In what way, however, does this insight arise? When the mind is properly calm and peaceful, it is this very peace that we then use to train ourselves in basic contemplation. This means investigating the physical body to which the heart clings as ours or our self. This clinging attachment or upadana, is the cause of renewed existence, the cause of birth, the cause of aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. When the heart has upadana, attachment, towards the body, then this physical form is perceived as our self, or as something we possess, with the resulting experience of us and them. There is also the appearance of desire and aversion, and the process of origination begins with the renewal of being and birth, and is always accompanied by the arising of dukkha. It is this very dukkha that brings renewal of being and birth, and which creates upadana, attachment, tanha, craving, kilesa, the defilements, and finally avidya, ignorance, fundamental ignorance. This is paticca the process of dependent origination evolving according to the conditions of defilement. However, when we develop sila, samadhi and banya, as we have come here to do, by determining to keep precepts, training diligently in mindfulness and samadhi and striving to cultivate wisdom, then this is called walking the noble path. When we listen to Dhamma, 
We can also focus upon the in-breath and the out-breath, establishing our mindfulness on the sensation of the breathing, together with the mantra, Buddha. This is also practicing sila and samadhi, together with banya, wisdom. In as far as training the mind in tranquility is concerned, when the mind is peaceful, then we can contemplate what this physical body that we habitually attach to as me and mine is actually like. What was its minuscule form at conception like? What did it look like in the womb? What was the body like when it was newly born? How did it develop? And upon what does its life depend? If our body goes without food, water, oxygen or warmth, then its elemental properties cannot sustain themselves. The body that we cling to as our self must eventually disintegrate according to causes and conditions. If we contemplate in this way, the wisdom will arise that if this body we habitually cling to is really ours or our self, then why can we not control it? Why is it that although we don't desire it, the body grows old, sickens and dies? We don't want old age, sickness and death, so why do these things happen? The wisdom will arise that these things are normal. They are the way of nature. The heart will then disentangle itself from this upadana, attachment, and that is from the sense of me and mine. If this body was really our self, we would have command over it and be able to direct it away from that which we do not desire, old age, sickness and death. But it isn't like this. This lump of a body follows the natural law of cause and condition. The manifestation of sila is the arising and sustaining of mindfulness and wisdom through the restraint of body and speech. The heart is firmly focused in samadhi without the hindrances of restlessness, anger, ill will, sloth and torpor, agitation and doubt. At that moment, the heart is free from all the hindrances and possessed of internal peace and serenity this is the manifestation of samadhi. We then use the power of this samadhi for contemplation of the body, analyzing it in terms of elements or khandhas. Investigate this body for yourselves. Contemplate the external body, that is, the bodies of others, and the internal body or the body within the body, that is, ourselves sitting right here. What is there inside this body, wrapped in skin and hair with its nails and teeth, we must investigate to see what there is, analyzing its components into elements and khandhas so that the heart will acknowledge the truth and give rise to insight. This is how we train our hearts in wisdom. Through frequent training in wisdom like this, the power of samadhi will grow faint and fade away. We must then focus on bringing back and strengthening our mindfulness and concentration by training our hearts with a samatha meditation object without letting up. Whatever our posture may be, whatever our thoughts or feelings might be, we must observe and look after our heart continuously. Those things that wander into awareness are namely forms, sounds, odors, flavors, bodily sensations and mind states. If the heart lacks concentration, then it will chase after this sensory contact, giving rise to becoming and birth together with happiness and suffering. The number of these becomings and births are countless. Life at present takes many forms, always cycling from birth to death and from death to birth, sometimes human, sometimes subhuman, sometimes with the growth of wisdom as devas, and when the heart grows in peace even as Brahma gods. Consequently, we must put forth effort to train ourselves by patiently enduring sensory contact and the moods that arise in conjunction with this. If we allow this sensory contact to possess the heart, then samadhi will be weak and wisdom won't arise. Sila, that is virtuous disciplined behavior, is an essential aspect of the training that requires our careful attention. Sila includes well-mannered composure of conduct and speech together with patient endurance. This virtue of patience and forbearance is a trait and a treasure of the sages and saints. When possessed by moods such as anger and ill will, 
We can initially practice patience and forbearance by determining not to follow these mind states. When we can patiently endure and curb our feelings, then this is called practicing the Dhamma of restraint. Patiently containing our moods and mind states means knowing how to contemplate in order to renounce and relinquish from the heart these feelings of lust and hate or anger and ill will. We generate renunciation and self-sacrifice by sharing what we have for the benefit of others. We must also be sincere in our aspiration to develop goodness and virtue. Being born as a human and encountering the Buddha-sasana is not easily accomplished. The Lord Buddha gave a simile expressing the immeasurable difficulty of gaining a human birth. It is more difficult to gain human existence than it is for a blind turtle living in the great ocean and which surfaces only once every hundred years to come across a floating bamboo ring that is being ever blown by the wind in all four directions. Nowadays, the greater number of those born as human beings can be called human only in outward form. On the level of the heart, however, they are not yet complete or perfect human beings. It is extremely difficult for the heart to become fully human because of the ever-blowing wind of sensory contact. Our hearts and minds are blown back and forth by the wind of forms, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, moods and mind states. Lacking peace, our sila is shaky and concentration doesn't come. Therefore, we can look within our hearts and ask ourselves, will it be difficult to realize our humanity? Through contemplation, we come to see the danger in lacking sila and also the benefits that these qualities of virtue and discipline bring. Practicing sila brings us internal happiness, peace and security. In Pali, these qualities are referred to as Boga Sapaya, the most excellent of treasures, that is, internal spiritual wealth. This is called to mind in the phrase, Sīlena Sukhating Yanti, Sīla is the vehicle to happiness, Sīlena Boga Sampada, Sīla is the way to spiritual wealth. When well restrained in body and speech, we can see that Sīla is something of immense value a vital wealth and the most perfect of possessions that can free our hearts from the cycle of birth and death. Whatever worldly wealth we may possess, it cannot free us from the suffering of samsara. The greater the heart's greed, then greater the delusion and clinging attachment, and the greater the growth of desire. And this desire is what gives rise to the binding snare of upadana, attachment, which, even if not very strong, is difficult to abandon. However, when we are determined to practice sila, we can see the many advantages to be gained. That is, we realize how restraint, modesty and graceful behavior of body, speech and mind bring happiness now and in the future. Sila is an essential inner wealth that will enable our minds to know and see the Dhamma and realize Nibbana that is, peace and coolness within the heart. Therefore, we must be determined to be well trained in our behavior of body and speech. We must train our hearts in proper concentration, but this requires the use of a meditation object, as has already been explained, whatever this may be. We can practice Marananusati, the recollection of death, contemplating the uncertainty of our lives and the certainty of death. We continuously reflect that having been born, we also must die. Wherever we hear news of death and dying, we can likewise reflect upon our own mortality. We cannot escape from death. Suppose that the global human population amounted to 5,000 million people, of whom 50 million die every year, 500 million every decade. If there were no new supplementary births, then within a century, the entire population of the world would have passed away, all 5,000 million people. However, because there are additional births replacing those who have died, we fail to see the presence of death, excepting those terrible events that stem from natural disasters involving water, wind or fire. When great numbers of human beings die through events such as these, then we can feel our own mortality and are able to reflect back upon ourselves that we too must also die 
we cannot escape from death. When the heart is peaceful, following on from whatever the method of training employed, whether the contemplation of death or contemplation of the loathsomeness of the body, then the insight can arise that really there is nobody who dies. What we take for a person is only the four elements shifting and changing according to causes and conditions. At that moment, the clear insight arises that there is no self or soul, no person or being, no me or you. This insight manifests as a non-verbal, non-discursive awareness. This is the arising of the wisdom that is known as vipassana and is dependent upon a mind that has previously been concentrated with samatha meditation. When the mind has been so concentrated, then whenever possessed by attachment to conventions such as the self, simultaneous insight into not-self will arise at that moment. This is what is called vipassana. We realize that referring to the body, whether our own or that of others, as our self or their self, as this being or that person, is only a convention of speech. Really, there is no person or being, there is no self or soul, and there is no us and them. It is this realization right here that was spoken of as a non-verbal awareness arising in the heart, clearly knowing and seeing the Dhamma, leaving no room for doubt. Training ourselves further, we put forth effort practicing walking and sitting meditation until our hearts become calm and serene. Peace and pity, spiritual rapture, arise within our heart, whatever our posture. Previously, we had to be vigilant in our practice and strive hard to arouse energy and effort. However, when the mind becomes peaceful, the practice takes on a discipline and a momentum of its own that pulls us onto the walking path and the meditation cushion. With mindfulness watching over the heart, knowledge and understanding arise. The one who guards and cares for their heart will be freed from Mara's snare, delivered from all dukkha. With mindfulness carefully watching over our heart, the objects of attachment will be seen and with reflection let go of. When all sense objects are seen as anicca, dukkha, anatta, then the heart becomes peaceful. However, we still cannot afford to be negligent. When the heart is stilled with the calm of peace of samadhi, then we must return again to the investigation of the body, contemplating this sankhara that is a real source of clinging attachment. We must strive to uproot this upadana right here. If we continuously practice in this way, then wisdom will arise, enabling samadhi to develop. This samadhi in turn will aid in the arising of sila, that is, in the cultivation of discipline and restraint. We call this practice the threefold training of sila, samadhi and panya, which can be expanded to include the eight factors of the noble path, as explained by the supremely enlightened Buddha, the teacher of devas and humans. Bhutto means one who is awakened to the truth. After the Buddha's enlightenment, then due to the power of his great compassion, rather than dwelling alone in the bliss of liberation, he went forth with loving-kindness to teach the multitude, beginning with Venerable Anya Kondanya, the first of the Savaka Sangha. This realization and transmission of the Dhamma continues through our teacher and guide in the practice, Lompo Cha, right into the present. I believe that if we diligently apply ourselves to his teachings, then peace and happiness will arise in our lives.